Hello and welcome to The Extra Mile. I'm Linda Boudreau. Our guest today is Chesty Harrington. She's an artist from New Iberia. She's brought some of her work with her. But I think looking at her work is just kind of a, a part of it, hearing her story and visiting with her, I think is also going to be a wonderful experience. So Chesty, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you and for inviting me. We have been chatting before, the, before today's show and you have got a wonderful, rich story that goes with your art. Um, so kind of just... I think probably a lot of people around Acadia are, are, are already familiar with you and with your work, but maybe for those mm -hmm. who are not, how did you get started? What is this, where did this come from? Well, as a very small child, um, I grew up in New Iberia between, on the old Spanish, between the Old Spanish Trail and Bayou Tash up on Rose Hill, and it was so rich with characters. There was all sorts of people around. and. I was really interested in the people and every, every, and what they did, how they did things. I didn't understand and I'd ask questions, you know, well, why is this person like this? And my mom said, well, don't talk about it. I'm going, but, but I want to know, you know. <laughs> tell me, mama, <laughs> tell me. Yeah, yeah. And um, every spring and every fall, my parents would take us down to New Orleans. We'd have to go up towards Opelousas and then over to Baton Rouge and cross the river. But when once we got to New Orleans, you go down Carrollton with yeah. all the big palm trees, and you'd end up at City Park at the Delgado Museum, and that was just wonderful. I just, I just loved the paintings. And of course, Delgado was very small in those days. And then the other thing we'd do is, of course, go to the fair and then go to the French Quarter and visit a lot of the shops. And there was an artist, when you'd walk through this carriageway, they had these huge canvases, because I was little, you know, I was probably five or six years old, and there were canvases that were much bigger than I was, wow. and they were spooky swamp scenes and little shacks on the bayou, and I just loved them. And when we'd come back to New Iberia, I'd remember these things and think about them, and they were so rich. And I had a dream one night. I was, I guess it was a dream. I was sitting on the side of my bed and I was thinking about how wonderful it would be to be able to paint like that, like the paintings at Delgado. And of course they were master painters. <laughs> and I remember this voice within, you know, saying, you will. So your, your, your course was set. My course was set very, very early on. And I had parents that were, uh, cre had a very creative environment for us, provided a space to experiment with things and be creative. And um, it, w it was just a really good start. You know, there was no, no judgment. All the people in the neighborhood, every description was there. And I got to enjoy and know all these people. And a, a lot of the things that I've painted on and off over the years have been memories of these people and their places, their homes, the way they did things. And their place in your life. It's part of me. It's yeah. part of my life, yeah. the richness and the understanding of other people. And um, so at that point, this course was set. I was going to be an artist. And I got very interested in music. I started to play the piano, but I kept coming back to visual art. And that's what I did. I just kept at it. I taught myself, really. I was very... I was going to ask, I mean, did you go to art school? How do you learn how to do what you do? Well, I, I just painted. I had a, a, my uncle gave me, my godfather gave me a paint by numbers one Christmas. I guess it was eight or nine. And I did one of the paintings, and then I didn't like following that. I didn't like coloring books. <laughs> you were outside so, those right. lines, huh? So I took the other two canvases, and I did some paintings of flowers that were in the yard. You know, of my grandmother had these beautiful poppies. And I remember doing that. And someone in New Iberia has it. I don't know who. I sold it for $5, I remember. <laughs> <laughs> I was a little kid. And uh, started showing, painted, and started showing at the Sugar King Festival when I was probably 10, 11 years old. Whoa, then and you continued. started very, very early. Yeah, yeah. and um, worked hard at it, learned teaching myself to draw. There was an artist in New Iberia by the name of Ella Fontenot Keene, who was very accomplished, and she had studied in many places, including Florence, Italy. 
and would teach me little things because my parents really couldn't afford mm -hmm. the lessons. But she'd come along and she'd say, well, you know, honey, if you would do this or you would do it like that, and I, I would, I'd follow her instructions. And she's no longer around, but I really appreciate her hand. As I, when I started doing the wood release in 1968, she stepped up and she says, I want you to come to my studio because I have some things I want to teach you. You need to know these things because no one else around here knows them. And she did. She taught me some, some weights, some techniques of mixing color, mixing my own colors. And I did, and I've used them ever since. What a gift. And, yeah, what she a was a wonderful, great, wonderful great woman. Gift. I want to talk a little bit about your wood release because that's part of what you're known for, and it's right. it's a, a, a tad unusual. There are not yeah. that many people, I don't think, that do wood relief, are there? There are several that do them now. Yes. Okay. Uh -huh. I know probably three that do them. Out of all the artists in the world, yes. you know three. Yes. <laughs> yes. And you, how did you get? First of all, what is it? Let's start with what is it. Exactly. Well, it's a it's a low relief. It's called polychromatic bar relief. It just means multicolored low relief. Low relief meaning you don't go it deep does, It's not a wood. deep relief, okay. no. Okay. Um, I had been struggling with painting and learn, teaching myself to paint and draw. And I took a correspondence course. And at about that time, my brother decided he wanted to uh, go to art school and be a commercial artist. Oh, so it ran and, in your family, did it? Yeah. <laughs> and so he, he went off to art school. And every time he, I was by then had a couple of children, he'd come home during the holidays and he'd bring examples of what projects he'd been working on, like etchings, engravings, linoleum cuts. And one Christmas, he brought me a portrait of himself. It was a black ink something on white paper. And I just loved it. I said, this is, how did you do that? I'd always ask, how, do you, how, how is did this do done? That? Because I didn't have much material. I didn't know the different techniques. And he said, well, this is a wood block print. I said, oh, I like that. That's not, it's striking, you know. He says, and I kept after him. He says, well, come on out, I'll show you. He had a little red Mustang, I'll never forget. We went outside and he threw the trunk open and in the trunk was six or seven of these block, wood blocks with black ink on them. And I, I looked down at him and I grabbed one of them. I said, this is it. And he says, no, this is not it. This is the block you print from. I said, no, you don't understand. It was like a marriage in my mind at you that point. See. All the drawing and coloring and I could see the wood because I love the texture of the wood. Okay, and that's really what you, I want to get a shot of the old lady here on the sofa sitting next to you because I want to talk about this particular one. This is an, you did this one a while back, I think. Oh, uh, it's a couple of years. Okay. Oh, so it's not that old Yeah, no, all, no, but. I've been holding a few things for the LSU show, so. And we're going to talk about yeah. that, and so she's okay. going to be in the LSU show. Yes, she will be. So let's talk about her now. This is, this is Wood Relief. She's absolutely amazing, by the way. Thank but, you. The, the other thing that's striking, aside from the kind of dimension that you get with, with the carbon, is the color and the sense of light mm -hmm. in it. Is that, is that from learning how to mix colors from your friend, or is well, that the wood? <laughs> I think it has something to do with all of the above, but particularly the value system, the lights and darks. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. you, you know, when you paint, um, you can paint from light, from dark to light. Mm -hmm. using your darkest and then coming up and it's a handling of the light okay it's all about the light and it really comes it, through in that yeah, would it have that same effect if it had not been carved i think so okay because the canvases well this is a canvas down we're going to move over here to this canvas this this piece is not complete but i grabbed it out of the studio because it was this so bright talking about here yeah um, and uh when this piece piece is completed uh it's going to be difficult from a distance to see whether it's which is or which. Not. Yeah, it's it's more to do with the control of the edges and the values, and the the light. You know whether okay. it's well, I just don't know what. It's to say. just what you do. I remember Taylor Clark uh, about thirty years ago saying to me, "It's amazing, you you." It's hard to tell whether it's a carving or not from across the room, and when you get closer to it, more texture. Yeah, you know, but it. Uh, is yeah. one easier or harder to do, or is it kind of all the same no, for you? It's it's about all the same. Physically, it's more difficult to handle the wood. As, yeah. I, as I've done so many of them, thousands of them, um, 
I'm starting to have a little problem with my right <laughs> shoulder. But uh, I pace myself, you know. I save myself for the good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> the, things that, the things that you want to do. Yes, yes. And here, up here, um, we're going to wait for them to get a shot. It's a delightful one of a couple dancing. And I just think that is so much fun. And that's a special piece, too, isn't it? Yes, this is a friend of mine, his wife. This is Ruben. Uh, he's from Buenos Aires. And down in New Orleans is a group called Casa Argentine. And it's about 800 people that are originally from Argentina. And they put on a, a, it's a big dinner about twice, well, once a year now. And they bring a group in from Argentina to play. And they have performers, usually one couple, one or two couples that dance. And then we're invited to get up and participate if we like. I can do a little, but not much. And, Enough uh, to move around, huh? Right. <laughs> and the, the, um, it's a difficult dance. Yeah. But it's beautiful. Yeah. It's and really beautiful. You, uh, I and think it must of, be fun. A, lo a lot of people, you, you think Argentina and Spanish, of course they speak Spanish, but the tango was Italian. And there are a lot of Italians and Germans in, in Argentina. And uh, Ruben is Italian. And that's his wife, Paulina. So this is this is some of your work, but you you, you really work in a lot of different mediums, don't yes. you? Yes, I do. Is, is, how did you? I mean, is that just because you like to experiment? Because a lot of people yes. become expert in one and no, not no. you. And I, I've done so. Like for instance, I did so many wood carvings in the first couple of years. After a while, I'm going. I got to do something different, you know. You so were getting I, no bored. Well, not so much bored, but it was time to do something different. Okay. You know, it's like. Too much of the same case. Yeah. So I started doing the sculptures, and I got very interested in printmaking. And in 1984, I had the opportunity to go up to New York, my first visit up there, and just fell in love. And visited the Art Students League, came back to Louisiana, and I had a, a nice little place on Bayou Tash between uh, Cecilia and Arneville. Oh, it's so pretty out and there. And it's gorgeous. I had like eight magnificent live oak trees, Aww. and it was just beautiful. But anyway, I went to New York and uh, came back, sold the place, and I had friends going, oh my goodness, how can you sell this place? It's like paradise. I said, you got to let something go, let something come in, you see. And I've done that many times in my life. But I went to New York and I studied printmaking. I studied lithography. And that was quite an experience. I uh, studied with Richard Dorian and uh, Michael Pelletieri. And then I came back to Louisiana, I went back to New York, and I studied sculpture with Sidney Simon. And I had a wonderful opportunity of working with uh, life drawings with uh, Marshall Glazer, who is now deceased, but he was a friend of Matisse. And I just, <laughs> I learned so much from him. He wow. was so wise. Well, he was in his 90s when I studied with him. But he was very sharp, and he was a good friend of Jacob Lawrence, the, man, the artist from Harlem. And he would come into the classroom. It was a great experience. What an it opportunity, was huh? It was what, worth letting what go. fun, yeah. yeah. It was. <laughs> and then I went out to New Mexico, and I studied uh, casting at Chidoni Foundry. and came back. I bought kills. I had ordered a printing press. And um, then I had a surprise. I had my last baby coming. <laughs> I was 45 years old. And you have six and, children. Yes. Is, and so I just, just work all the time, okay. and it, uh, it's fun. So you did, all, you, did, you did your art, and you found your way, and you raised a family. Right. So you've been busy all these years. Yeah. And it's not over. <laughs> no, it's not over. It ain't over till it's over. That's right. Um, how about the, 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 the sculpting? Now, these are made out of, well, let's get a shot of these, but these are made out of what? These actually are are cast and they're fired. Okay. But they also they look like bronze. They, they do. usually they usually polychromed with color, full color. But this was a set I had and I said, well since we have so much color, let's bring the bronze casting pieces. But these are fired. They actually okay. fired. I have a sculpture studio at the house that uh, that's done. I also have half life size garden sculptures. That's quite a job. And of course, Keith helps me. You met Keith earlier. Right. Keith is with us. Helps he's, me. he's our live audience. I Keith. couldn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> They're very heavy, very physical pieces. And they are, you know, 36 inches tall. And I have three right now. I'm working on the fourth piece. And uh, yeah, you're both small pieces, but you do big stuff, too. Oh, yes. I mean, oh, yeah. I'm going to. Gonna pull up the pull up in this book and, and show a piece that I just am blown away by. But while we're doing that, uh, 
or while we're getting ready for that. You, when you were talking earlier about, about your work, you, you said that you see it as spiritual expressionism, which I think is an absolutely wonderful phrase, but I don't know what you mean by it. Well, it's to, the way it happened for me was to work with my, my left side of my brain for years, learning this talent, taking the talent and learning the techniques. Okay. Getting the skill set, so to speak. Getting the skill set. And I remember asking Harry Worthman, I guess I was about 12 years old, how do you how do you do this? Because mm -hmm. he painted so beautifully. He says, you got to draw, draw, draw all the time. Don't draw anything that you can't erase and draw again. <laughs> you know, don't, don't be limited. Draw, learn to draw. So I learned to draw. And then I said to him, how, how do you get style? Now I'm 12 years old. He says, you don't worry about style. <laughs> style take care of yeah. itself. You're 12. But in that, all those years, and meeting uh, Martin Sissel, who was head of the Emissaries of Divine Light up in, in Colorado, began to understand the gift that we each have, each one of us, what we have to offer. And through learning your skill, then you have you can provide an opportunity for something to move through you, whatever's needed. And that's where the right, right use comes in, where you let things come through and you, you live long enough that you're able to discern what's appropriate and what's not, okay. right? Right. And what, what do we need? You know, like yeah. I said earlier to you, the magical child. <laughs> Mm -hmm. yeah. Exactly. And I want to go back to that real quick, and we'll talk about it some more, but when you were talking about your own childhood, mm -hmm. you talked about the fact that your parents created space mm -hmm. for you, for your, for your own magic to develop, for, right. for you to have those opportunities. And um, how, can, how do you think we can do that? Because that is what brings the ability to be, to be like a, a, a pass through, you know what I mean? Yeah. Well, I think to uh, provide a safe surround, but let them be. Let them unfold. Let them learn. Let them dig in the dirt. Let them get muddy. You know, let them taste things. And I think it's a really important word when you, use the un when you said unfold. Because it is. Right. It's an unfolding right. of, of, the, of the individual that's there. Right. That's and there from the moment they're born. They're already who they are, I think. That's right. Yes. But, you know, some people will... And, and I've always objected to this, and maybe I'm wrong, but I don't think that I am, is to uh, burden too young a child with abstract thoughts like mathematics. And it's, it's just my way. Mm -hmm. you know, I think that children need to learn all those things, but I need when they're little people, say b before four or five years old, they need to be let to uh, l understand physics by sticking something in their mouth or, you know, falling or whatever. Learn about physics on their own, you know, with guidance. And at some point, I'd say about 11, they would learn. They naturally go into abstraction and creative, real creative options. And we could use a few creative thinkers. I mean, serious. I think we need that right now. Yeah. You know, yeah, and I'm not talking about just the, I'm not talking about the arts. No. You're I'm talking, talking about, about the art of living. Right. Exactly. You know, exactly. The you're whole talking, art of yeah. living. Because when you, know. you, when you use the word, if I've got this right, spiritual expressionism, you, you do yours through the visual arts. But somebody else may do it through... Uh, Taking care of children. Right. Being or a cook in a cafe. Good leadership. Whatever, whatever it is that you do. There's yeah. all of it. You know, there, there are... There are there are plumbers that could be wonderful doctors, mm -hmm. and there are some doctors ought to be plumbers. And both you know are what I mean? And everybody gets because, all mixed you know, up. So if we can, if if everyone can figure out what their gift is, and honor that within honor themselves. That. So having said that, then I have to believe that creating art for you must be a joyful experience. Yes. <laughs> because you're you're following oh, yeah. your own truth when yes. you do that. Yeah. I want to. You, you brought this book with me. I want to give Danny a minute to get here because you have some. We talked earlier about your larger pieces. We're just going to do this real quickly because we have to talk about the thing at LSU too. 
But what do we have here? These are pictures of what? This is a 95-pound uh, longleaf pine wood block that came out of the Café du Mont roasting house down on Chapatula in New Orleans after Katrina Rubin, my friend from Argentina, brought me four big blocks and dropped them off in my studio and said, here, do something. It took me about a year. Well, all four pieces, there are four separate pieces, and it's about the creative process, water, air, earth, fire. And this piece is the last, the second to last piece, and it's about the physical manifestation. <laughs> and it, you know, there are four sides here, and you're only seeing two, but it's a, there's a child in a blue chair holding a gold leaf ball. And then there's a young woman who is with child, and as the piece evolved, the uterus was carved and the fetus is exposed, and she's wearing a crown like the Statue of Liberty. And then next to her is this middle-aged woman who is telling her some, the woman around the corner something. And in the original drawings for this, she was carrying an American flag and I didn't quite understand why. Now this is one of those dreams that unfolds. That's how okay. you got it. And then the third, the last side of the sculpture are the Mardi Gras and this old woman here. There are four ages of women and she's paying off the Mardi Gras. And I was in the uh, studio one day and I was painting on this thing. It took about six months of on and off, on and off. And I was all, I thought it was almost, I thought, well, I'm almost, you know, done. Let me see what else needs to be done. And I spun the thing around, and I was painting the stripes on the flag, and I was thinking about what the colors mean in our flag. And it, with the paint loaded of red, it dripped Ooh. onto the ground. And the, the pictures, the photographs here are not quite the last photographs of the piece that's okay. in the studio now. But the coins that are being distributed for the foolishness has fallen into this deep hole and the blood has now mixed so that the blood and money is mixing. And now I'm telling you I had the frisons standing in front of the <laughs> sculpture. And then a few weeks later I was out changing the flag on my front on the front of my house and my daughter was with me. Uh, she's also an artist anyway. I said, here, would you get up here and put the, take this down? I'm standing, she's on the ladder, and I realized that the little eagle was gone off of the uh, flag pole. So I said, I bet it fell down in the rose bush, and I got down off okay. the porch and found it. And when I picked it up, it's like it said, put me on top as eagles soar. And clearly looked at me, well, that's where it belongs. So that's what you did. Yeah, that's what that's I did. That's perfect. Okay. <laughs> We're getting a little short on time, and I don't want to get through today's show without okay. talking about the 60-year retrospect that's going to be going on at LSU. No, at uh, LSU Rural Life Museum. It's on Interstate 10 at Essen Lane in Baton Rouge, and um, there'll be about 60 pieces in the exhibit, and uh, some of them are coming from far away, and some of them are really close. And, uh, so you'll have you'll have work there. It will be there'll be a variety of all my stuff, and uh, from what a what an honor, again. huh, to be selected. Yes. yes. And it, so yes. when is this going to be? Uh, this will open on June the twenty second, and it'll run till mid mid, mid August. Okay, so people yeah. have a chance to get over yes. there and they'll be able to yes. see your work and other artists as well. Or no, this is it's just, just you. This just, is a one yes. woman show. A one woman retrospect, sixty years. So you've been doing this for sixty years. Well, actually, a little, <laughs> yeah, a little longer <laughs> than that. But the earliest piece I couldn't find. I, I know where it is, and it's in a house with a lot of other stuff, and they, the lady passed away and her niece can't find it. <laughs> but it's in there, so. Uh, you know, and those things happen. And yeah, that's, that's all right. Down that's the road fine. it'll turn up, but it won't, it doesn't matter. Oh, really yeah, doesn't. believe me. It, it in, the course of, in the course of the universe, that no. is not going to be no. a, a biggie. No. So somebody no. watching today wanted to get in touch with you or wanted to maybe purchase a piece of your art or whatever, how would they go about doing it? Because it's not as easy to find as it once was. Oh. Well, you can go to the website and give me a note, write me a note. And then there's nothing easier the phone, than that. Give me a call. I'm usually in the studio. So I, may, I may not answer. Someone else will. 
Okay. But you have a studio in New Iberia. Yeah, that's my, really I live and I have uh, my studio and my my residence in the same, it's an 1890 house. And um, I bought the property next door, which is a craftsman, American craftsman, just about six, eight months ago. And I've turned it into a guest house. So. Okay, so we can find you. It's just down the yep. road. I'm down right the road. down the road, not far away. Well, it's just <laughs> so wonderful visiting with you. I want to thank you for coming today and for bringing some samples of your work. And I know there's much, much more. So it would be just a thank great you. treat to go check it all out. Thank, thank you. you so much. We have been uh, talking to Chester Harrington. She is an artist in New Iberian. If you want to find out more about her, check out her website. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for watching The Extra Mile.